is it called? The program is called the Native Law Center Summer Program, formerly known as the uh, PLSNP. And uh, what are the age groups or the target audience? Uh, it is for students who have uh, an undergraduate degree, so usually be in their probably in their 22 kind of age range and higher. It is a graduate program, so it's not a direct entry. And uh, what is the aim of the program? The summer program was created to increase the number of Indigenous people studying and practicing law in Canada. And it is an eight-week summer course that occurs prior to the student entering law school in the fall. And uh, what, what is the program intended to do, like uh, the learning objectives? The program teaches uh, students first-year property law, and as well it teaches the skills that they need to be successful in law school. So legal writing, legal analysis, and how to brief cases, write legal memos. So how do you measure the success of your program? Well, we measure the success of the program in a couple of different ways. Uh, one thing is by the enrollment. We see that the enrollment has gone up over the years. In 2011, we had 28 students in the program. Uh, last year, we had 47, so there is a growing demand. We also, uh, most of the law schools in Canada accept our program for credit, so that, a, and they will, almost all the law schools in Canada do send students to our program, mm -hmm. sometimes as a prerequisite for them to attend law school. So that's an important piece. But also, I think one of the, what we would um, say across Canada, we estimate that about 75% of the Aboriginal lawyers or Indigenous lawyers started their educational career at the summer program. And uh, program alumni have gone on to become lawyers, judges, uh, government officials, professors, and also pursue further academic studies in law. And for example, the current president of First Nations University of Canada, Dr. Mark Dockstarter, attended the, the uh, summer program prior to going to law school at Osgoode. One thing though, in regards to the success of our program alumni, it's important to note that our ability to monitor how many students have um, advanced onwards in legal education and beyond, it, it's difficult for us to really track that because of privacy mm -hmm. legislation. And so we right now are just monitoring it, monitoring the development of our alumni as best we can through actual personal contact with alumni, such as um, the interviewer's uh, <laughs> cousin. <Yeah. laughs> like you know, we seek out people who've gone through the program and then connect with them and ask them to um, then connect with us. But we do know that the, a lot of our alumni are very successful, uh, which is really gratifying for us. What is Indigenous education? It's a broad question, um, yeah, um, and there's a, a number of ways you could approach it. I, I think Indigenous education is any form of communicating knowledge that involves Indigenous students or indigenous knowledge keepers or faculty or involves the transmission of indigenous knowledge itself, traditional knowledge. It can kind of approach it in terms of the participants in the, in the endeavor or the actual kind of knowledge. And so I see indigenous education kind of in those two, kind of potentially being aspects of this, those two, two dimensions. And so it, it, uh, but a, a form of decolonized education, I would say, would be one where the institution respects indigenous traditional knowledge, includes it within the curriculum, and whether the students or the teachers are indigenous or not. So it's, it's paying respect to that source of knowledge in terms of um, education. How would you define the word indigenous, though? I would I would define indigenous as people who uh, existed prior to the assertion of authority by a colonizer. So, indigenous peoples in North America would be would be First Nations, Métis, Inuit, uh, any indigenous group that existed prior to Canadian authority exerting and forcefully assuming authority over that territory. Is this the term indigenous one that you would normally use? 
Increasingly so, in my, in my situation, being in the law, you're well aware of the other legal terms that Canadian, the Canadian government has applied to Indigenous people without their consent in most cases. So I, I use Indigenous because it's consistent with the international language, uh, that in particular referencing the United Nations Declaration. And so I want to identify with that more positive standard of uh, Indigenous rights rather than Aboriginal, which is based on the Constitution, which has identified rights that are, that are less than those of the Declaration, for example. So I prefer Indigenous uh, for those reasons. Although I, I think we need to be increasingly more specific as to what people we are, like if, we, rather than using these catch-all pan indigenous phrases or pan Aboriginal phrases, we should refer to our, our nations themselves, the, the Cree, the Métis, mm-hmm. you know, the Dakota. What is your vision for the future of indigenous education? I would like to see. Um, Indigenous education be inclusive of Indigenous knowledge. I'd like to see Indigenous peoples in places of authority, in positions of authority, and in educational institutions. I'd like to see the treaties and their and the tre- treaty right to education be manifest more significantly in terms of governance authority of educational institutions. So that would mean, for example, in the university here. Uh, you would have an Indigenous component to the governance authority, um, not just the Senate or the Board of Governors, but you'd also have, say, an Elders' Council or something, but with real authority, not just in an advisory role. Mm-hmm. So, to me, that's decolonizing, um, and anything short of that is just kind of indigenizing uh, in, the, in the kind of a, just getting uh, Indigenous peoples in, in the system isn't enough. So, uh, what, can you think of any types of information that, if you had now, it would help to achieve your vision? I, in terms of the program, I think it would be useful for us, um, right, Kathleen, to have more data from law schools about graduates, uh, Aboriginal graduates, and more data from the law societies about Aboriginal graduates and and their success rate in, in article and data on their career path. I think it would be very useful for us administering the summer program to have that kind of data and and for law schools to be more open to sharing that data with us right now they're not very open to doing that and so we struggle with trying to understand the statistics of how many Aboriginal lawyers are in the country for example we don't really know uh, very good we have a good idea but we don't know the exact numbers so aside from the programs in which you are personally involved what information do you have on other Indigenous education programs in Canada? Well, I know uh, at the University of Victoria, they've just started a, um, a joint JID program. So it'll be a, um, it's a, maybe you can speak to it a bit more. It's, uh, but it's very exciting. Yeah, right? it's, it's a pretty important initiative in the sense that the program will teach Indigenous people's law as well as Canadian common law. So that it'll have components with respect to Coast Salish law, probably mostly sent British Columbia kind of oriented Indigenous people's laws, Coast Salish and, and other um, peoples from that area. And the students who go through that four-year program will not only have a degree in, in common law, but also a, a degree in Indigenous people's law. So that's pretty significant. Here at the College of Law, uh, we'll be introducing a new course next, next year called which means um, kind of setting things right, the reconciliation course, really, that the TRC said in a call to action that all law schools should include in their in their curriculum. So the College of Law is introducing that course next year here. Mm-hmm. And other law schools are too as well to some degree, but there still is a fair bit of work in terms of recognizing Indigenous people's laws as a valid source of law in Canada. But the Native Law Center is uh, working on uh, promoting Indigenous law, uh, both in terms of research and in uh, encouraging the law schools to be more inclusive of, of Indigenous law traditions. So that's pretty much all the questions that I have, but is there anything else you guys would like to add? One of the, I meant to bring this up was the idea of like 
talking about programs of excellence in education or Indigenous education, the program, uh, the summer program that we have, when it began in 1973, there were only four Indigenous lawyers and five Indigenous law students in Canada. And within the first 20 years, we had 373 alumni come through the program and go on to law school. And by 2011, a total of 832 alumni had gone through our program and graduated from law school. Now we have a bit of a gap in our um, information from 2011 to today, but we do know to date, like as of 2017, 1,635 Indigenous students have attended the Native Law Centre summer program. We just don't know how many of those have went on to successfully complete law school. One thing is sometimes people realize by doing the summer program that they don't want to go to law school. Right. Like they just realize it's not for them. That's important because <laughs> law school is a three-year commitment mm -hmm. and it's good to know right off the hop if it's not for you and not it isn't for everyone. So we don't consider that to be a failure or anything. But so when we say we've had to date 1,635 alumni to go through the program, we estimate probably 85% of them would have gone on to law school. but that's where we need more information so we could actually say for sure how many went on to go to law school, graduate, how many went on and got their articles, how many are practicing lawyers, how many went on maybe to um, postgraduate studies. So that's one thing that we are working towards. Um, yeah, and the, the program has been quite successful in that respect and, and even other um, disciplines like nursing and medical schools have approached us to see how they can model some a program similar to ours to increase the number of students attending those disciplines uh, in, 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 ed in education. So it's been around a while and, and people know that it's actually uh, accomplished a significant impact in the number of um, lawyers uh, who are Indigenous in Canada, so it acts as a, as a model. And I think one thing, too, which I didn't kind of um, highlight, is one of the really important pieces of the summer program is that it does serve to create a really strong bond, kind of a professional bond, within the people who go through the program. So we have, say, last year, 47 students attended the program. They would have come from all across Canada. And once they were done here at, at the U of S, at the Native Law Centre, they would go to their respective law schools across Canada. But we know that these friendships that are formed in the summer actually are maintained throughout the career of the uh, law student, like the, the law student and then the professional, uh, which is pretty exciting because yeah, yeah. it creates a very strong yeah. kinship group, yeah. which you see in the Indigenous Bar Association, yeah. which they will join usually. Yeah. So the um, alumni are also very much connected usually to the Indigenous Bar Association, which is a national association of uh, Indigenous lawyers, judges, and law students, and so they meet annually. In fact, the next annual assembly will be here in Saskatoon uh, in the fall. Yeah, and we hope to have a, an alumni reunion event as well um, in conjunction with the conference.